for living see. In the past video we discussed the uh, the concept of classification types of classification classification we said there are two of them natural and artificial uh, whereby we talked the, about uh, their characteristics uh, their advantages and their disadvantages so today let's see the major groups of living things uh, first we have to know that the study of classification of living things or the study of grouping living things according to their similarities and differences is what we call the taxonomy now the major groups of living things are the kingdoms now there are five major groups see these kingdoms of living things which are the first one is kingdom monera second one is the protoctista third one is kingdom fungi uh, fourth one is kingdom plantae and the fifth one is the kingdom animalia so we talk about uh, these each one of them in the, our next videos let's start with the lengths of classification now there are seven lengths of classification the first one is kingdom the second one is phylum or division uh, phylum is for animalia and the division is for plants the third one is class fourth one is order the fifth one is family the sixth one is genus and the last one that is species now according to these ranks the highest rank of classification is this the kingdom and the lowest rank the species now every known organism has a particular place in each group now they can be classified and be grouped according to these ranks now from the kingdom to the species uh, in the kingdom there are major features but when you're going more down to species it means that the, the organism that are grouped together are more clearly or close to each other this means that their characteristics and the, their similarities are more the same so let's see the scientific naming of living organisms uh, the scientific process of naming organisms is what we call the nomenclature uh, now we talk about the binomial nomenclature this is the biological naming system using two names so basically when you have these organisms we will have to name them now naming of them is essential as in order to know that this name can be used internationally so biologists assign the scientific names to organisms so as to avoid confusion among themselves since scientists from different countries use different languages now the scientific names are uniform in all languages latin language is the word is used in assigning these scientific names because it is an official language and that this language is no longer subject to changes this means that it is considered to be a dead language hence names once given remained unchanged so they cannot be changed again so specifically the names are used like always moving on let's see the rules of binomial nomenclature now these rules are the ones that are applied when naming uh, these organisms with these two names the first one is that the scientific names of organisms must be in a latin language and if the names are derived from other languages they must be latinized so basically this is very important it has to be written in latinized if it's not from latin language and the names should be derived from the latin language the other one is that a scientific name of organism has two parts we have to know that there is a genus name and a species name so the species name and the genus name are the components of a, of a scientific name the third one that a genus name always starts with a capital letter and a species name follows with a small letter so this has to be known or noticed when writing these scientific names and the last one is that in type in type these scripts a scientific name must be written in italics or underlined if a hand is written now let's see example of a scientific name a human being his scientific name is homo sapiens homo is the generic name and the sapiens is the scientific name let's see about viruses uh, viruses these have various characteristics the following are just few of them the first one is that they are the smallest living organisms 
are so they are very small compared to other living organisms. The second one is that the viruses do not have a cellular cellular structures, which means that they lack they lack certain important organelles like the nucleus, cytoplasm, both bodies and the others. The third one is that they can only reproduce inside a living cell, hence they are parasitic. Uh, so they cannot reproduce outside a living cell. The other one is that they have a simple structure consisting of either DNA or RNA, but not both, surrounded by a protein or lipoprotein coat. The other one is that they can be described as a living or non-living, since they can only be seen as a living in the another body of an organism and not living when outside the, the surroundings. They are highly specific to their hosts. This means that each virus recognizes only certain types of cells that can occupy in an organism. The other thing is that viruses are capable of replicating themselves only when they are inside the host cell. But when they are outside, they are like non-living organisms. Let's see the structure of a virus. Generally, viruses have a very simple structure consists of the following. The first one is that the RNA or DNA, which may be a single-stranded or double-stranded. Now, this they form a structure called a core. Now, a protective coat of protein surrounding the core is called the capsid. So they have this capsid and the nuclear capsid, which is the combined structure of a core and a capsid. And then they have also an envelope that is an additional layer of lipoprotein layer around the capsid. The capsid are made up of identical repeating units that are known as capsomeres. Capsomeres. And the, let's see an example of a virus that is a bacteriophage. This is the virus that attacks and decays bacteria. Now some of them have had with the tail shell. You see the advantages of these viruses. The first one is that uh, they are used in developing vaccines. For example, vaccines for Mrs. Polia and the rubella are made from the viruses that have been weakened. The second one is that the viruses are used in biological weapons to kill organisms. The third one is that they are used as vectors in genetic engineering to transfer genes from one organism to another for improving or treating the defective genes. The last one that the example this bacteriophage are viruses that attack bacteria and hence they open in controlling infections and the diseases that are caused by these bacteria. You see the disadvantages of viruses. Uh, most viruses cause diseases to both plants and animals. Plant diseases such as tomato, tomato mosaic, uh, cassava mosaic and the tobacco mosaic and the other animal diseases, for example, measles, smallpox, and the poliomyelitis and the yellow fever are all the diseases that are caused by these viruses. Thank you for listening, guys. So that's all for this video.